Hello and welcome to another edition of Out of the Blue. I'm Mike Browning. We're coming to you from just outside the shiny new pearl on MTSU's growing east side of campus, the brand new Student Union. The $65 million gem continues to grow toward a late August opening. With nearly 211,000 square feet of space, the Student Union is sure to become the hottest place for students and others as they gather this fall. The impressive building features a bookstore, six new food service venues, a food court and casual dining restaurant, a game room, an 840-seat ballroom, an 84-seat parliamentary room, and a 95-seat video theater. Lounge spaces that include collaborative technology, email, check stations, flat screen TVs, a fireplace, and seminar rooms. Offices for the Center for Student Involvement and Student Organizations. And a television lounge and other lounge spaces that include collaborative technology. Both the JUB and KUC, MTSU's two previous student union buildings, will continue to be used by students, faculty, staff, and others. The JUB's popular Tennessee Room and Hazelwood Dining Room will remain available to reserve for events. We'll have more on the new student union in an upcoming episode of Out of the Blue. Well, MTSU and Melekshaw University in Kayseri, Turkey, have forged an agreement effective next spring that will allow academic and cultural exchange between the two universities. MTSU President Sidney McPhee and Melekshaw University Rector Dr. Reshik Uzkenja say the agreement will allow third-year students from Turkey to finish their studies at MTSU and earn degrees from both institutions. Dr. McPhee says part of MTSU's academic master plan calls for increased ties abroad. During the past decade, MTSU has increased its international undergraduate and graduate student enrollment, expanded study abroad, and developed faculty and student exchanges. MTSU's Center for Innovation and Media has earned national recognition from the Associated Press Media Editors. MTSU received honorable mention in the Innovator of the Year of College Students category in the 2012 Journalism Excellence Awards. The university was recognized for reforming and reshaping its student media into what judges described as a model for journalism schools and professional news organizations. The awards will be presented at the group's annual conference in Nashville in September. I Am True Blue was introduced to MTSU in August 2011. It is the first line of the True Blue Pledge, which spells out four core values, honesty and integrity, respect for diversity, engagement in the community, and a commitment to reason, not violence. What started as an affirmation of the best ideals shared by the Blue Raider community has grown to represent much more. I Am True Blue now signals the university's commitment to student success and our devotion to the institution. MTSU marketing specialist Rob Jansen recently created a series of Blue Raider profiles to help define what it means to be true blue. My name is Nick Winchester. I'm a nursing major here at MTSU, and I have hopes to become a nurse practitioner after I graduate. I chose MTSU because visiting here as a child, it felt like the right place. My name is Nick Winchester, and I am true blue. Few American correspondents understand war like Sebastian Younger, the best-selling author and Oscar-nominated co-director of Restrepo, the gripping documentary featuring an American platoon in Afghanistan's hostile Korangal Valley, a godforsaken place that U.S. military commanders ultimately decided to abandon. Now, earlier this year, just months after losing his friend and co-director Tim Hetherington, who died while documenting the war in Libya, Younger shared his unique perspectives on war with both a larger MTSU audience and a smaller group of MTSU journalism students. Since the September 11th attacks, a generation of soldiers, their loved ones, and a nation have been affected by the decision to go to war with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in this remote part of the world. We thought this subject deserved more in-depth attention. When Sebastian Younger appeared on the stage of Tucker Theater on the MTSU campus, he carried the credentials of an award-winning journalist who for more than 20 years has reported from all parts of the globe, Sierra Leone, Liberia, the Middle East, and Bosnia. But for J-School journalist, his ladder of success, from cultural anthropology to climbing trees as a tree trimmer to simply heading overseas, is more than unorthodox. 
Sarajevo was besieged. It was 1993. And I wound up there with a bunch of other freelancers I'd made friends with, three or four other guys. And I, I gradually figured it out. And I started filing radio reports. I mean, I got, I mean, I was at the very bottom of the media food chain. A Serb paramilitary groups that surrounded Sarajevo and other cities and were shelling them. And it was horrible. It was like Misrata. It was the, the Misrata of the early 90s. And um, I just went there and I thought, Maybe if I just go to a war zone, I'll learn how to be a war reporter. And um, rather than learning how to be a war reporter than going to war, that maybe it works the other way around, and it does. I mean, it's Bosnia gave Younger what he says was his first no intoxicating sense that he was doing was something important that had real meaning and consequence beyond his life. But for sheer terror, Younger says Liberia was the worst. He was accused of being a spy by the Taylor regime, and the rebels were attacking the city colleague Tim Hetherington, whom he didn't know at the time, was with the rebels. Younger was in the city in hiding from the Taylor government. And it was um, just horrendous. And I had, I had PTSD after that, like, unbelievable. He managed to secure magazine assignments covering wars. In 1996, he traveled to Afghanistan to write about the Civil War and the Al-Qaeda training camps in the Tora Bora Mountains. I remember being in Jalalabad the summer of 96, and an Afghan pointed out to the mountains and he said, there's foreigners out there, there's Arabs up there in those mountains, and they'll kill us if we go up there, and we're Afghan and we can't even go there. They're foreigners and they're training for something, and this is wrong. Younger says 9-11 brought memories of that conversation to the front of his consciousness. He returned to Afghanistan in 2000 to cover the leader of the Northern Alliance, a coalition of fighters who were battling the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. The Taliban had taken over Afghanistan just after he left in 96. I'd, I'd been in a number of wars, but I'd never quite seen war like this. I mean, um, but the Taliban were dug into entrenched positions on this ridge, and from that ridge they could shell Massoud's only supply route out to Tajikistan, where he got all his supplies from. And winter was coming on, and he had to shut down that position. You know, they hated the Taliban, and I remember getting hugs on the in the streets of Kabul by Afghans when they found out that I was an American. They would come up to me and literally thank me for what my country had done for them in, getting, in kicking out the Taliban. Younger thinks that achievement was squandered by the lack of manpower, resources, and neglect following the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Really a city liberated. I mean, it was am amazing. And, you know, we kind of squandered that. I mean, you know, like the short version, in my opinion, is we went off to Iraq and, and completely forgot Afghanistan. I think we left 15,000 soldiers there. There's 40,000 cops in New York City. Like, it wasn't going to work. Had we devoted the amount of national energy we put into Iraq, into Afghanistan, I literally don't think there'd be a war there right now. As the war dragged on, Younger sought to be embedded with American soldiers to see the war through their eyes. The stories were first told in a series of magazine articles for Vanity Fair. With Restrepo and with, with my book War, what, what I wanted to do, what Tim and I wanted to do with the movie, was just communicate for civilians what it feels like to be a soldier. I wound up um, with a battle company of the 173rd Airborne. I was in the Korangal Valley of eastern Afghanistan, a um, six-mile long valley. Um, 150 men of battle company were there. And while I was there for a while, a, a fifth of all the combat in all of Afghanistan a fifth of all the combat being a, 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 for 70,000 NATO troops, a fifth of it was happening inside the Korangal. And I was with them for two weeks in Zabul in December 05 and just was blown away by the quality of the men. It was all men. Um, the quality of the men, the dedication, the toughness, just the everything. I just couldn't believe it. And if, they, if Battle Company goes back to Afghanistan, I want to follow them for a year, a platoon for a year, for as much of a year as I can. In 2007, Younger spent most of his time at an outpost called Restrepo, a 20-man position of essentially a platoon intercepting Taliban fighters. As he put it, no internet, no phones, no running water, no way to bathe for three to four weeks at a time. No alcohol, no television, no women, no nothing that young men like, none of it was out there and those guys were out there for a year. 
In 2001, Younger brought out the book War, a full-length version of the story of being embedded for weeks with young men who faced constant enemy fire in the Korengal Valley, just north of Khyber Pass. I mean, Restrepo was a 20-man position, and the enemy, had they been willing to lose enough, enough fighters, they could have overrun it. I mean, they, would, they could have killed just about everybody up there, and every, we all knew that. For the documentary Restrepo, Younger and Hetherington wanted to avoid politics and focus more on the experiences of soldiers in combat. And soldiers in combat, at least the ones I know, are completely uninterested in the politics of all this. I mean, they're just not. You know, it's like cops aren't that interested in, you know, the socioeconomic realities that lead to high crime. You know? Go right more. Uh, they were in something like 400 firefights during their year. They were in an enormous amount of combat. Everyone out there was almost killed, um, including me and my colleague Tim Hetherington. Younger recalls seeing soldiers walking around with holes in their uniforms from close rounds passing through the fabric, but not their flesh. I was leaning against some sandbags one morning, not much was going on, and um, to understand the story, you have to understand how bullets work a little bit. They go a lot faster than sound, so if someone shoots at you from a few hundred meters, the bullets go by you before the sound of the gunfire reaches you. And bullets, when they go by you, they're pretty subtle. I mean, the sound they make is pretty, pretty subtle. It's a kind of strange snapping sound. And, and literally, if someone shoots at you from a distance, the first thing that goes through your mind is a question. Like, are we getting shot at? Like, is that, you know, everyone kind of looks at each other in puzzlement, and then a half a second later, you hear the gunfire. Yes, you're getting shot at. And so I was leaning against sandbags, and um, not much was going on, and some dirt flew into the side of my face. <laughs> I just had to, time to think, what the hell was, you know, like, what the hell was that? And, and I heard the gunfire, and it was the first round of the first burst of an hour-long firefight. Younger says the bullet impacted the sandbags inches from his head. Later, he thought about the math and the angle of deviation at 400 meters for something traveling 2,000 miles an hour, missing by three inches. You realize after a few incidents like that, and we all had a few incidents like that, you realize that it's all random. And that's a real challenge to any sense that God's going to help you, or that being a good person will help you, or that you know you have a wife and kids back home you need to return to, or you're a good soldier, or whatever you might think is going to help you, it really challenges that idea. Younger says it can easily give one an existential crisis. You know, like, am, I'm alive because you know, I, there was a gust of wind that deflected the bullet by an inch. Like, that's what this is about? That's all the meaning life has? Um, I don't know the answer, but I know that the question was painful to me. I can't imagine what that question feels like to a 20-year-old, and they all dealt with it. So I became interested in that sort of conundrum, like, okay, if courage tends to get people killed, why, is, why does it happen? I am True Blue. As a member of this diverse community, I am a valuable contributor to its progress and success. I am engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner now and forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue. different here.
you know, I kept seeing these incredible acts of courage under fire. And I had to summon my own form of courage because, I, you know, I just understood that if I kind of lost it psychologically out there, I was going to endanger other people. And, you know, my whole life, either doing tree work or, or war reporting, dealing with your fear is like the central task you have to take care of. I'm in a group, other people are depending on me to, like, not lose it in the middle of a firefight or not fall out physically on a hard patrol. Um, I was twice the age of all those guys, and I would reassure myself, I'm like twice the age, but I'm carrying half the weight. Like, that was the <laughs> thing I did with, in my head. I wanted to understand the emotional experience of combat, and I divided it into three sections, fear, killing, and love. Like, those are the three primary kind of emotional food groups of the combat experience. So what evolved was, okay, I want to get as deeply inside the soldier's experience as possible, inside their subjectivity, inside their emotional world, inside my emotional world. Um, and I wanted to understand, you know, finally, I wanted to understand how courage worked. Because on the face of it, in sort of Darwinian terms, it doesn't make much sense. I mean, at its most extreme, you're 21 years old, you don't have kids, you throw yourself on a hand grenade to save your buddies, your DNA ends right there. So I became interested in that sort of conundrum, like, okay, if courage tends to get people killed, why, is, why does it happen? And um, the book, I mean, I don't say it explicitly, but the sort of subtext of the book was trying to understand why young men will do this for each other. Not for a cause, not for their country, not for all the stuff that gets them to sign up, but out there on the battlefield, they're doing it for each other. It was intact, Younger likens it to self-sacrifice a parent has for a child. What parent, he says, out, wouldn't risk their lives we to save their kid. No one would call it RPG bravery, impact. he says. RPG they would say, that's parenthood. Well, soldiers as well, they hate calling that bravery. They're like, well, that's just being a soldier. If you don't risk your life to save your buddy, you're not a soldier, forget about it. For them, the, the term courageous soldier is like redundant. You can be a soldier, you can be a coward. But a courageous soldier is completely redundant. It's like if, you're not, if you don't have a certain amount of courage on the battlefield, you're just not a soldier. We flew in. Remarkably, Younger says only one of the soldiers chose to leave the army when his enlistment was up. The rest stayed in for another deployment. Like others, Younger naturally wanted to know more about the soldiers' post-war experience. First question for Brendan was, so, Brendan, is there, is there anything at all that you miss about being out there, anything at all? And he looked at her without a trace of irony, and he said, ma'am, I miss almost all of it. Younger sought to explain what a soldier meant when he missed combat and war. Why, he said, would any sane person miss it? What they're actually missing isn't, you know, adrenaline and killing and, you know, whatever, all the obvious stuff. What they're really missing is brotherhood. They're missing a sense of utility and connection and usefulness in a small group of people that they care about and are willing to die for. Younger says when soldiers come back to society, the sense of meaning is less clear. Not sure of their purpose, their role, what society wants from them, suddenly Younger says the tribe goes from a handful of comrades to millions. That's almost sort of agonizing to soldiers. What they miss is not killing, they miss brotherhood and a sense of uh, utility in a small group. Younger suggests the platoon in combat experience exists on an ancient level, much like small connected groups in society. For soldiers, identity doesn't matter as much as being a good soldier, Younger contends. If you're willing to risk your life for the lives of your brothers, that's the bottom line, courage. You, you know, you don't need to be tall to be brave. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to be, no one's born brave. You can't buy it. Like, there's no way to achieve that except by deciding that the lives of people you care about are more important to you than your own life. We all have access to being brave and compassionate, Younger suggests. It's entirely on us, he says, whether we are or not. And there are very, very brave people who are in prison, and there are cowards who are kings. It also takes courage to cover war and conflict. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, more than 40 media workers were killed in 2011 while reporting around the globe. One of them was Younger's good friend and co-director, Tim Hetherington. 
A few weeks after attending the Oscars, the Arab Spring was flowering in the Middle East. Tim went to Libya to report on the civil war there. Uh, and on uh, April 20, he was hit by a mortar in the town of Misrata, um, hit in the groin with shrapnel, um, bleeding very heavily. Another journalist named Guillermo Cervera, a Spanish photographer, put him in the back of a pickup truck, and they were driving like crazy to the um, hospital in Misrata, and Tim bled out in the back of the truck, and he died. Not the first guy that I've known who was killed not the first journalist I've known who was killed, but the first one I was really close to. And uh, it was a terrible, as you can imagine, a terrible day for me. After Tim's tragic death, a Vietnam vet wrote Younger telling him that he and Hetherington had done a great job of coming close to understanding the real truth about war, but not quite all the way. The core truth about war is that you're guaranteed to lose your brothers. And he said, you know, until now, um, in some ways you guys didn't understand the first thing about war. And now you've lost a brother, and Sebastian, you understand everything you need to know about it. That's what war is. Younger admits the Vietnam vet was absolutely right. Among other things, it made him decide he didn't want to inflict that pain on anybody else. I'm 50. I've been doing this for a while. I've had too many close calls. And right then and there, I just decided, you know, I'm out. I'm going to keep foreign reporting. I'm going to keep doing what I love to do. But no more pickup trucks filled with rebels on front lines. That's, that's over with. And Younger had to figure out how he was going to continue in journalism and feel question. equally intense I mean, and meaningful always, covering issues that opinion, aren't war. Almost, I'm figuring it out. And I, it's, a, it's funny, like, I made that decision literally the day Tim died. And I've never regretted it. I mean, I don't miss it at all. I'm actually quite relieved to not have to go out and do that stuff anymore. Even so, Younger believes the arguments between the left and the right about the inherent qualities of war, whether war is good or bad, are simply false arguments. The confusing and intriguing thing about war is that the good and the bad of it coexist. Uh, and you have to understand them and both and integrate them um, or you're missing what war is. I mean, war is a lot of things. In fact, war is just about everything. And you can't, there isn't any one single truth about war that, that excludes all the other truths. It's everything. It's good, it's bad, it's beautiful, it's ugly, it's, you know, it, whatever. It saves you, it kills you. I mean, whatever. I mean, anything you want to say, any cliche, it's, it's all true. Younger started a medical training organization for freelance reporters called Reporters Instructed in Saving Colleagues, or RISC. The bulk of reporters working on the front lines are typically not covered by insurance, and they're not trained in medical response or battlefield medicine. Learn more at www.risktraining.org. As simply asking people, please don't pollute so much, don't drive so much, please businesses don't pollute, produce so much pollution, that's not enough. We started in 1911 with a clear mission to train Tennessee's best teachers. For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more. Nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. This is not just a recording studio. This is not just a flight school. 
this is not just a university. This is MTSU, home of Tennessee's best. In our professor spotlight this month, one MTSU economics professor has used the message in Dr. Seuss's The Lorax to teach students and citizens about environmental economics. Dr. Michael Hammock says the story of the Lorax, a grumpy but charming creature who speaks for the trees, is a powerful example of the need to make big companies more environmentally friendly. If you remember the Lorax, that's Dr. Seuss's environmental tale, uh, and it's about a, uh, a man named the Onceler. Not really clear if it's a man or not, but something, probably a person named the Onceler, who moves to an area, cuts down all the trees, drives off all the animals, and then uh, finds himself suddenly out of business, much to his surprise. And it's, uh, it's, it's supposed to be a warning. We should take care of the environment lest we find ourselves impoverished. But I and my co-authors, and I am a recent Alp Ed, argue that, in fact, it's not a very useful environmental warning because mostly businesses are not keen on driving themselves out of business. They don't like large losses. They don't like to suddenly find themselves uh, suffering huge negative profits. They don't like that. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense to argue that they will destroy the only thing that's making them lots of money. Um, at least not if it's something they own. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's like coming home to your house and deciding to drink all the, all the beverages in your refrigerator and eating all the food and then suddenly being surprised that all your food and drink are gone. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. You can have the tragedy of the commons, where people mistreat public property, common property. Um, and in those situations, economists have proposed solutions such as um, a carbon tax, a pollution tax. Me taxing you for producing pollution is a disincentive for you to produce pollution. Um, and we need to have some sort of system like that, or we might need to have some system like that, to uh, reduce pollution. Um, because as simply asking people please don't pollute so much, don't drive so much, please businesses don't pollute, produce so much pollution. That's not enough. Dr. Hammock's policy research incorporating the Lorax first appeared in the Journal of Private Enterprise. His work drew national attention earlier this year when the Lorax tale reached the big screen in a full-length movie created by Universal Pictures. For more information on MTSU News, be sure to go to mtsunews.com. That's it for this edition of Out of the Blue. Until next time, stay true blue.